You haven't, you haven't tuned into an episode of the Sky at Night with Patrick Moore. At design meetings, sorry, modern technology. At design meetings, I've been informed positively and negatively that architects come from another planet in terms of our design ideas and perspectives. Well, I can assure you we don't. We have our feet solidly based on planet Earth by gravity. So, Ian, can you, can you hear me? Wave, if you can hear me. What do you see, Ian? Don't worry, we'll discuss it later. Um, the human brain, marvellous and sophisticated. It has been established by psychologists that the right-hand side of the brain governs creative, fluid, processes and the left hand side rational structured processes. Architectural psychology. For the purposes of this presentation I'll be exploring and simplifying two schools of thought in architectural psychology. Structuralism and Gestalt psychology. These are the simplistic ways of explaining the, sorry, the simplistic way of explaining these two theories are structuralism deals with the development of a design from a micro perspective, maybe at atomic level upwards. Gestalt psychology deals with the development of a design from a macro perspective, a global overview. The in intersecting diagram area, yellow zone, represents the ideal balanced architectural brain and mind possessing both Gestalt and structuralist attributes. So, so here we have the micro and the macro and the best of both worlds is what an ideal balanced architect has. So delving into the ideal balanced yellow zone of an architectural brain, you have the two parallel mindsets operating at the same time. For example, micro areas dealing with concept and brief macro areas dealing with the global site and scheme context. This is a very simplistic, this is very simplistic modeling of a couple of architectural psychology theories, which are welcome to explore in greater detail. With these parameters in mind, how do, the, how do these translate to the real world? I can expect you would ask. I fundamentally believe that architecture is about understanding people, the site and construction holistically. So I will lightly outline project briefs, design concepts, and refer to aspects relating to site analysis and building construction. So let's review four very different schemes, varying in scale, complexity, and architectural sector, which I have designed, developed, and delivered. Gary Thomas, what do you see there? Don't say anything at the moment. We'll talk about it later. The Landmark Hotel, Marylebone, London. The Landmark Hotel, what was the brief? To refurbish a former prestigious grade two listed Edwardian railway hotel once described as a temple of luxury 
at the time it, the, the project commenced, it had seen better days and had become British Rail's Dowdy headquarters. The project involved transforming it to, in a, a, to a renewed, no expense spared, luxurious oasis, oasis in the heart of London. So what are we looking at here? What was the design strategy? The strategy was essentially to increase the number of rooms and suites up to from formerly a 200 to 308. The former, the former external courtyard space was um, covered with a new glazed roof and associated portal frame. Um, we went to transform the modest palm court which is shown here. This was the former modest palm court and that was uh, expanded to create a, a new piazza winter garden atrium space with mature palm trees. Um, we also created new internal um, atrium elevations, which were faced with um, high rock cement boarding. And there was the creation of a new subterranean car park. So these are, so what, what I want to talk try and con constantly reiterate the architectural brain thinks um, on a macro scale as well as the micro scale. So it's the concept of the, the building it's in its entirety, but the elements at the same time that make up the building. So moving on to a typical plan. The, um, the innovations with this particular scheme involve the creation of um, the green, if I refer to the green rectangles, not creation of, the green rectangles here on the um, left hand screen here, here we are, uh, represent prefabricated bathroom pods, which were manufactured in Germany. The red zone, which the, 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 this, this model of bar, bathroom pods is replicated on all of the floors throughout the hotel. Um, it, was a, it was a precursor to the MMC, Modern Methods, of construction and um, it was one of the first um, major commercial hotels in central London to use that that strategy. The red zone here on the right represents an e the east and west wings which had their widths, uh, the actual width of each wing was um, respectively expanded. So this is a construction drawing which shows the wing being expanded to allow for an increase in um, floor plate depth and the accommodation of bigger um, or larger bedroom suites. So here we have the um, representation here on the left of what was done with the new atrium facades. We um, recreated in the spirit of the um, existing vocabulary of the architecture of the building, we created new um, atrium facades uh, which were made out of cementitious board, pyrop boarding, and mold, mold formed shapes for in particular around the um, arches and circular windows and um, keystones within the elevation vocabulary. So again, we're looking at the whole here as opposed to, it's the whole, with well, the Gestalt Ferry looking at the whole the sum of the parts as opposed to the parts in isolation. That's what an architect thinks about. Uh, we, we look at the parts, we look at the components, and we look at it as a whole. Just moving on to the next. So here's a space. This is one of the piazza, this is the main piazza space as it was described in our strategy. We created a new portal frame structure to support um, new patent glazed roof that spanned over the former open air courtyard. This courtyard was exposed before. It was white glazed tiles, very um, unremarkable appearance. But now we, we've transformed it into a, a new atrium space with the, the new supporting structure. So who's the next person? Paul Singh, what do you see? We'll talk about it later. <laughs> Next scheme, 
former police station at Eaglesfield Street in Maryport, Cumbria. What was the brief? The brief was simply set by um, a developer. He wanted um, me to maximize the land value with planning gain and uh, adapt a very unusual um, footprint, which was a former police station with cells um, and an adjacent stable site. This, this, this particular um, Gothic, Victorian Gothic building is, is literally like the Doctor Who's um, TARDIS. From the outside, it appears very small. But um, as you'll see, the next picture has got a variety of um, modes. So this is the mode. So fundamentally, we're looking at the, the transformation of this um, footprint. I'll just move on to the next slide to give you an appearance on the, you can see how the, slide, the site proper varies and the um, very quirky um, vocabulary that made up this building. But it's, 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 it's very deceptive because it was much deeper at the back. The plan will give you a much clearer um, understanding of what constitutes the footprint. So here we are. The modules, this modular axonometric represents the different components that made up the footprint. We have a, a courthouse, the former planning consisted of a courthouse with accommodation, the, um, the cell block area, uh, the ancillary support area for the police station and it was a former stable area here and a garage again another stable area here and that's um in relation to if we look flick back to the see up the slope and beyond they've got a much larger zone beyond the strategy behind the development of this plan was to ensure that all the all the adjacent spaces or adjacent apartments always had access to a, a, a courtyard. No matter how small, there was a courtyard adjacent to key spaces, irrespective of where the, um, the aspect of each apartment was. You have street facing apartments and then almost landlocked apartments, but they've actually got, it has actually got a courtyard to provide natural ventilation, views and, and limited vistas from even back in the heart of the plan. It's a very deep plan and the circulation had to be accommodated within the existing footprint or the existing footprint had to accommodate uh, the, um, the plan's configuration. So moving on to the next slide. So also in terms of context, the, um, the scheme was looking to integrate Rein, this slide's moved slightly. There, there is a to encourage a passage through a pedestrian passage through the site, which would allow transfer for pedestrians through. This had been sealed off by the council, the the, the former police um, authority, with a, a, a solid brick wall. So it was to encourage through passage of pedestrians here, as well as um, making provision of the new housing here, which was. This was formerly a large stable and um, accommodation of addi additional accommodation at the first floor level of the um, existing building. So looking at the comp components that con constitute the building, again, what we try to do with this diagram is to break down the components that constitute different types of um, residents. You've got the orange, are mezzanine apartments, the blue are single story apartments, the yellow is another apartment, and, and then you've got a rear apartment here. The, the courtyard spaces highlighted in yellow here, and then the, the two residential properties at the back, which slot in here into uh, essentially to, to, to marry up with the existing grain of the um, housing, adjacent housing. So moving on, again, what, I, what I'm trying to, to show here is that it, it's the sum of the parts that constitutes the scheme in this particular um, arrangement. It's very, um, it, it's, it's very inconsistent, very inconsistent elevations. They, they go up, down, gable ends, um, hip ends, 
all constitute in the same building, but they, they, they make up these so almost micro components which constitute the scheme. So these, these knit together almost like a, a Jenga toy. Well, well, it's not a toy, it's a building. It's almost like, conceptually, it's like a Jenga um, composition. But this, this is how the building was actually configured. And it was to make the most of this configuration was the, the objective and at the same time satisfy the developer's um, requirements. The component, the, the, fun, the, the ultimate achievement was um, 11 development units that came out of this scheme. So he was very pleased with that. So um, moving on, show, show another configuration, another, another elevation that's shown the, the juxtaposition, different, different elevations, different scales, and it was all part of the existing vocabulary in this particular building. Very unusual um, texture and, and composition, which had to sort of mesh with what was already there. So moving on, time swift, swiftly. Diana Crouch, what do you see? Don't worry, we'll talk about it later. The next scheme. Five and six, the embankment Putney. The, the brief for this particular project, I'll show you the location. It's a unique location. Um, in London, um, the riverside by Putney, not far from Putney, the Oxford Cambridge boat launch is actually here. It's just about, it's just about, it's a bit further down here. Oxford Cambridge boat race takes place along here. So if you, if you watch it regularly, which will be coming up, you'll recognize it. So it's essentially these two properties on a short terrace. The um, developer, had a particular brief, let me just flip back. He wanted, a, the brief was to create two distinct, distinctive prime residential homes from two terrace properties. So let's flick back to this. So what was the strategy? The strategy, what was the context? The context you can see, the strategy being to create a family home, and a, a, a slightly more open planned, um, modern free flowing home with um, can more, more really free flowing spaces as opposed to conventional confined box like spaces, which you'd have in a, a traditional Victorian property. So, so the strategy was then discussed with the developer was to create one property that could be easily occupied by a, a family with, uh, and the other property would Potentially be um, a couple who didn't really have kids because because of its location there weren't there wasn't the opportunity there or there isn't an opportunity to have large gardens so the rooftop becomes the prime space for entertainment and enjoyment here so other ideas that were being explored with this scheme was um, juxtaposition of old and new um, building fabric the interplay of opaque and transparent elements and optimizing views and vistas. So the following slide should pick up these elements as well. So let me just move on to that to give you a better idea of what I was speaking about. So here we are. We've got the juxtaposition of the old fabric, the new modern fabric, and a sort of dealing with a buffer of transition between old and new with glass, which is a common theme that um, we tend to do as architects and at the same time providing an opportunity for more amenity on the rooftop with um, rooftop studios. So the, these models look at how conceptually um, in, in my brain or in our brains we could conceive that um, the existing building is, is broken down. You have your rooftop element here Sorry, go back. We have the rear element here, which was totally renewed, which, which actually does re represent the way in which the construction took place for this particular project. The, um, the original fabric was retained here, the blue element. Sorry about that, technical. The original fabric was retained with the blue um, component. 
And the new components are the purple elements. So here we have two rooftop studios and then two new extensions to each respective property. So let's um, have a look at um, the appearance and the detailing. This is the roof. This is an image of the roof, one of the rooftop studios. There are two flanking studios. Maybe I've gone a bit quickly. I might drop back a bit just to show you the axonometric again. Here we go. You've got the um, two rooftop studios, glazed rooftop studios, and the extension to the rear. And then we have the River Thames running in front of the, the properties here. So let's move on. So next image is the interplay is representing the interplay of transparent now we like to use uh, i suppose we like to we like to use our other words to describe our um our conceptual elements we use different vocabularies architects do i suppose to capture the sort of the magic which we're trying and the poetry which we're trying to trying to achieve so we've got um the interplay of transparent and opaque elements which essentially is the glass, the brick, and the render. So they're, they're giving that, 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 that interplay, and that, that dynamism, that the, 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 the potential reading of uh, floating masses, floating elements, uh, and the magic of um, light behind it, illuminating these elements. So uh, let's move on to the next. This is... This is more of an architectural um, realization presentation. So here we have the footprint of both of the properties. The one that I've just shown you the, on the flank on the corner here is represented by this property here. The River Thames runs in front here, the embankment. And the second property is here. So number five and number six. Also, looking at how space can be actually configured in a different context with um, the modern house or the so called modern house, the staircase was configured in the center of the plan to enable accommodation to, to, be, to, to act as a buffer between the, the old property, the old fabric, which is here, the new fabric is here. In so doing, removing the, the, the staircase out of the, the heart of the footprint, so it frees up much more uh, open spaces uh, and to give a sort of a different dynamic from the more traditional footprint with your you know, Victorian house, front door, staircase, wrapping its way up as you go through the property, which eats into the footprint, as you can see. So these were ideas that were being explored at the same time as trying to satisfy um, a client brief, which um, was very well received by the um, developer in the end. So here's an illustration of the rooftop configuration with the studios and how the um, studios are accessed internally. And there is, there is a, there's, there's quite a terrace there for both properties, which allows one of the, well, achieves one of the key objectives with views and vistas um, on this unique location at um, Putney on the Riverside. These are the existing, oh, the, 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 this is the existing fabric with the introduction of the new studios on top. And here's the um, existing element here with a new studio on top, back, and the extension to the rear buffered with the glass and the new extension. So um, it's the interplay between new and old, and it's um, buffered with a, a glass element. It gives you that dialogue between um, solid and transparent components. Paul Singh, what do you see? Tell me later. As I, uh, what, do you want me to tell you now? Yeah, tell me later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> ICU, the, in, the Intensive Care Unit Char Charing Cross Hospital at Hammersmith. 
So moving on, this is the, um, if, you're, if you're not familiar with it, this is the um, tower which constitutes the, um, which constitutes Sharon Cross Hospital um, in Hammersmith. So what was the brief in this instance? The brief in this instance, the client brief from the senior consultant was he wanted quality, which at the time was not um, prevalent in much of the NHS. Um, and I don't want your typical NHS unit. The, 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 the key drivers for this particular project um, was that he wanted to attract and retain high caliber staff from around the world. He literally went around the world to get the, um, the nurses, junior house doctors, junior consultants, and he wanted state-of-the-art medical equipment and he, he wanted this um, environment to be outstanding. So um, what, was, what, was, what was special about this? Well, this project involved um, extensive briefing with the clinical team uh, and consultants. It, um, it was used ultimately as, um, as a professional case study in the architect's handbook. And it's um, also used, the design is used as an exemplar for the HBN health building note standard for ICUs. So let's, let's look at the concept and how that translate to re translates to reality. So here we have, um, at the heart of the unit is the, the staff base. The staff base element was what the um, consultant wanted as the core of the unit to maximize upon observation of patients and access to patients. So um, the multi-bed areas, so this is the schematic. So the multi-bed areas are around here. Likewise, they're, they're shown here in the architectural plan, the multi-bed areas. We have two um, isolation um, negative, and pressure, negative and positive pressure rooms for um, immunosuppressive um, patients, I believe it was called. And then we have all the ancillary support and facilities at the back. And what was um, important, um, one of the key uh, considerations that the consultant wanted, he didn't want his staff having to, want, when they were treating a patient, he didn't want them to be distracted to have to go off to a, a remote storeroom to, to retrieve some sort of medical supply or sundry or, or feed. He wanted it in close proximity to each patient. And what, so that was achieved by having localized storage, which is, is around the perimeter of the unit. Um, what's also quite special about this unit at the time is that um, all the key medical gases, um, monitoring, body monitoring, and IT um, sensors are suspended from um, medical pendants, which are held aloft from the ceiling. So you've got no trailing leads for people to dislodge or disconnect by mistake. And it also allows for a, a, a variety of procedures because with um, a patient uh, housed in this unit, the, 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 the practitioners have a variety of um, procedures they have to take. Sometimes they, they will approach a patient or they need to uh, undertake a procedure from the foot of the bed. Sometimes it's from the head of the bed. Sometimes it's at the side of the bed. And sometimes it's, it's practitioners functioning in these areas all at the same time. And this is why the um, consultant wanted the flexibility in operation in this, in this environment. So this was crucial to um, delivering um, the medical care that he wanted. So I move on to the next slide. So let's look at the components. The components of the plan, again, back to our, the, the architectural um, psychology, psychological um, perspective in, in terms of theory. We've got uh, a unit in its most basic form as a core with a, a multi-bed multi space 
around the perimeter. But in its actual execution, the core is maintained, which is the blue zone, and the pink zone is the multi-bed facilities. And then we've got the, the other zones, the other, the other elements, the other components constituting the ancillary support. We've got a, another operating theatre, we've, um, we've got a specialist operating theatre contained within the unit, we've got its own pharmacy, uh, and we've got its own dirty and clean utility, which, which, are, can be, which, which removes the need to leave the unit. So everything's contained within the unit. So we've got ancillary space clustering uh, around the, the, the key spaces that they're serving with, with appropriate adjacencies um, and, and functions working at the same time. So this is, um, again, just to recap on some of the concepts that um, I've tried to convey in garbled or otherwise form. So if we, 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 we can move back to um, slide here, I'll just pick this one, pick this up right at the beginning of the presentation. Architectural psychology. For the purpose of the presentation, as I said, we were exploring and I will be exploring and simplifying two schools of thought of architectural psychology. One being structuralism, the second one being Gestalt psychology. The simplest way of these being expressed are structuralism deals with the development of a design from a microscopic pers perspective. So as a sort of an atomic building upwards. Whereas Gestalt psychology has a more global macroscopic view of um, design. So again, the representation here is of the, the balanced, there I say, that the ideal balanced architectural brain and mind will possess both of these. And the, the narrative uh, and projection is of these two concepts performing as one. So next time you see a, an architect in a design team meeting, and you wonder, is he, what's he thinking about? Where is he going with that idea? He's probably thinking about two things at the same time. And um, if not two, probably more. So um, at this point in juncture, I feel my presentation is, um, is finished. We're, we've, 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 I've tried to keep strictly to our time allocation and I'm, I'm happy to take um, any questions and I'll try and answer them. Thank you very much. Hi Sam, may I have a question? Hello. Uh, particularly resonated with me, the micro and macro part of your uh, presentation. I read an article recently and for me, uh, the two things that I made sense of as a builder were technical and creative. Uh, and, and maybe applying those, if you like, skill sets to various architects. Um, what it said in the article was that there were certain architects who had the design flair, which I would deem the creative architects. Yep. And then there were other architects who knew technically how they were going to actually physically build it and make it work. So I think there's definitely, to, to use your you know, micro and macro thing, I see it as technical and creative. Can you try and sort of rationalize that slightly for me? Because I'm quite intrigued about it. Well, it's, 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 it's interesting that you say that. Uh, I've always striven myself to, to have a balanced approach. You know, you, people say, oh yes, um, we don't want an architect who's very bohemian, doesn't know how to, 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 to consider all the technical aspects, the services, how the services, how we're going to coordinate. Um, the actual operations on site, and it's all well. It's all been. It's all well and good being creative, but I feel you've got to have a balance to be um, practical. Um, yeah, that's that's my perspective. Like, uh, this, is, this is more. You know, you could talk with our, our dear friend Ian and Gary. They may well, and and Craig. They may well have. Um, a particular, they, Craig might say he's more technical, Ian might say he's more creative, but I, I feel that uh, a balanced approach is the best, really. Um. 
interesting. That, that's before you introduce. You're talking about services. Sorry. Sorry. That, that, all of that's before you introduce a structural engineer or a, a mechanical and electrical services engineer, and that just no, a puts a whole, a whole other spin on things. No, conceptual state. A conceptual stage. You you do consider these. Well, I do. You you consider them at the same time. It's 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 not a building in isolation and then services afterwards it's it's a, it's a whole it's an integrated environment that's what you're creating that's how I, I perceive it you're creating an integrated environment and it's a holistic approach where you, you don't just think of um, services as an add-on later you know if you if you're dealing with a an eco home for somebody they want underfloor heating and you've got to in, incorporate the underfloor heating pipes and the manifold and the pump you don't want to be left in a position where you've got no position to put the manifold, you've got nowhere to put the pump, and then you've got to create a box out for it. No, you, yeah. it's the whole, it's, you, know what I'm, you know where I'm, what I'm trying to say. So it, it's a considered approach. That's the most important thing, is a considered approach. Tell me, while you're talking about services, I noticed your house on the side of the Thames there seemed mm. to have two flues coming out of one one elevation, which was the the house, I presume, on the uh, left-hand side. The that boiler. would indicate to me that the boiler for house number six was passing through the space of house number five. How do you get away with that, if I'm right in what I've seen? That, that flu was the, um, as a consequence of the client wanting to have a natural fireplace. And that flu was, that, that was done after uh, after my 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 participation he did that himself the client did that and he was very lucky he didn't have an enforcement notice issued so it was actually to increase the draft for the fireplaces that that flu was introduced it wasn't it's not boiler flu it's a it's a draft to increase the draft on the the um fireplaces here. thank you so it's not it's not it's, it's not my preferred component the client actually did that himself off, off his own work so, so Femi, um, that leads on to sort of the question I was going to ask, which is, having gone through that process of balance the, the macro and the bigger picture on a, on a project, how, how frustrating is it to then have, is it, is it a torment when the client then wants to change things at the last minute or, or changes things themselves afterwards when you've spent all that time on a scheme? Well, it's not, it's not <laughs> you've got to always have uh, that flexibility of mind to accommodate change, you know, um, you, you can't be... It can be frustrating, but you've got to be adept enough to say, okay, the client wants, to, and if, you know, if the client is introducing change, and then naturally they will be covered with a caveat for um, a variation really, but um, one has got to accommodate change. You know, the client is the client. You can't say, no, you're not having it. It's not, we're not all fortunate enough to be in a position of say, um, Miss Van der Rohe or, or, or Miss Van der Rohe or, or Frank Lloyd Wright to dictate what the client has. Because in those, those instances, the clients were subordinate to the architect, but um, that's not really not that's not usually the case. But you can often tell them how much it's going to cost to do the variation at the end, at the last minute, and they'll go, "Oh, in that case, maybe not." <laughs> I didn't say that. Okay. Okay. Any um, other? The spatial diagrams you've shown on your presentation or party diagrams were they something you done specifically for this presentation or do you use that as a way of it was, yes aid with um communication of the the concepts that's that's that they were spe specifically prepared because some of those plans they would not read in isolation as well as with a 3d representation 3d representation gives a, a much more um rounded perspective I feel than uh, and, and which is a tool now which we all we're all using in the profession now we're using 3D more to communicate ideas and concepts to clients this is, as opposed to just the 2D 2D plans sections and elevations that we used to do we're using a, what, what the, the most common program is SketchUp or SketchUp or um, Revit these are the tools that we're using uh, to communicate with clients concepts and ideas that we're trying to um, to deliver and satisfy her briefly. Yeah. Can I just ask, Femi, I mean, the, 
buildings we've seen have uh, all been existing buildings uh, where you've had to work with the space you've got. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's a different discipline if you're given just a, a plot of land and have to decide how to start from scratch? It's always easier when you've got a new build. It's always easier because you set the parameters. Uh, it's a different discipline, isn't it? If you if you're working to a, a context, you you you've got to work creatively. Whereas you can actually define when you're you're creating a new build, you can define your whole terms of reference: the the planning grid, the structural grid, um, the elements that what, what I didn't do in this talk which um, so just to save uh, at this point to, to caveat um, the, the the brief I didn't expand enough upon the fact that the brief and the site inform the design you know these are not elements that are looked at retrospectively or or, or shoehorned but but from the outset from day one your your site in and, and brief and consultation with your client informs the design. So yes, it's it's um, it's it, it's it's it can be challenging, not uh, but it's it's easy. I think it's it's much it's feel I feel it's much easier to have a new build than to have to work within a, a context. You you've got the confines of a different maybe um, planning grid, uh, different spaces, um, different disciplines, and different configurations that set the design in the first place. I can tell you're a postmodernist. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to say because the classic modernist approach is to say the site doesn't matter, we'll put a, a little uh, glass box exactly perfect on any site anywhere and then have a bit of landscape around it until you hit whatever streets or other bits of landscape have to be around. Well, that, that glass box is arbitrary. You know, it's not responding to a site, is it? You know, is well, it, that's, is that's the whole point, yeah. It's the, the modernist ideal is you, you have the perfect building sort of standing on whatever happens to be there. It's, 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 it's immaterial what's around you. you. You build the perfect example. But you're not responding to a context then or responding to a site. It's it's that, and that's, that's the failure of modernism usually. That's the failure of modernism. You, you tell, I'm, I'm a postmodernist at heart. <laughs> Sorry, we're getting, we're getting well off the subject. We're getting to sort of a, a well, debate here, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's good to have some sort of architectural debate. Once, once in a while. It's a bit macro, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, we uh, any other qu questions, queries uh, that you've always wanted to ask an architect and, and never had the opportunity? No. Well, thank you very much, Femi, for your present presentation. You. Very. Ring blocks. <laughs> Can I just ask you, what is that picture then? What Sorry. is the blobby picture, Femi? The blobby picture? Okay, I'll tell you what the blobby picture is. It's a Rochor. <laughs> yes, it is. What? Well, how do you pronounce it? Rochor or Rochor? Yes, yes, it is. It is. It is. Mr. Master Singh, is Master Singh still there? Yes, yes, I am. Yes, I've been, I've been dying to tell you. <laughs> Master Singh is a Rochor, isn't it? Yeah, yes, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's a psychological sort of test, isn't it? Yes. So how do you, how what do you, is it? How do you pronounce it precisely, though? <laughs> what do you, it depends. If, if we can do a round robin going down from, um, I can't see the names. Of, if it, I'm going to look it up. <laughs> yeah, Deborah, what do you see? I thought, I thought it was like a big fangy wolf thing. A wolf. So oh, if you, yeah. I've got, I've got uh, derivations here. If you see an animal's oh, face, if you see an animal's face, the, the symbols associated with faces and elephants give us information about how we confront problems and that and that and what our initial reactions when faced with challenges if you oh, well. if you perceived an animal's face and you were fearful for example this may show that you are experienced you have experienced some fear and panicked the thought of looking into the face of your inner issues an elephant may represent the elephant within the room or the big issue you all ignore. If, I'll run through the other <laughs> interpretations. If you see a bat, seeing a bat can be a healthy acknowledgement of your dark side. Oh! <laughs> I saw a moth, does that count? I saw, I saw a bat. I don't, I don't want to hear anymore, Femi. <laughs> <laughs> 
I thought it was a giant mutant bat. Oh my God, a psychopathic lawyer. Oh God. <laughs> you may either feel drained or unbalanced. I do now. If you, if you saw a butterfly or a moth, oh. butterflies okay. often represent, often symbolize transformation and transition, the ability to change, grow and overcome. Moths can be symbolic of feeling ugly, overlooked or a wallflower. Oh. <laughs> Henry, <laughs> all of the above. This <laughs> symbolizes our irritants, what annoys us, and our weaknesses. Perhaps you have a tendency to view yourself negatively and highlight your flaws <clears> rather than focus on your strengths and positive characteristics. So, if you see an angel, if you saw an angel, Ooh. an angel as a symbol, angels typically represent protection, goodness, purity, and spirituality. Since this was in reaction to the first card, it is possible you turn to angels in times of stress or view yourself as someone striving to possess the traits of an angel. So everyone sees something different there. Yeah. Sounds more like the horoscopes. 